prove that I love you, I swear I don't know how. You'll never know if you don't know now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois, for a very special Facebook Live event. It is Veterans Day. Of course, we can't express enough our gratitude and appreciation for the men and women who have served on our military over the years. And tonight we celebrate veterans, especially those from the greatest generation, a program I think you're going to really enjoy if you've seen uh, our special guest in the past here at the uh, Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, of course, if you're watching uh, from around the state, around the country, even around the world, please let us know in the comments section where you're watching from tonight. And uh, be sure to uh, comment in the uh, comments section below for that. Uh, and of course, if you have some questions, we will have some time for a little Q&A at the uh, end of the conversation tonight. So let's go ahead and get it underway on this very special Veterans Day edition of Facebook Live. We welcome in to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum our very own director of the oral history program, Dr. Mark DePew. Good evening, Mark. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for checking in with us this evening. And as he already said, I think this is gonna be a special night. I've got seen across from me, Vincent Speranza. Good evening, Vince. Good evening. So let's say very quick introduction for you, Vince, and then we'll get right to the program. Vince, an Italian family, grew up in Staten Island, was born in Hell's Kitchen, Vince, I think that's where you were born. Did I ever tell you that I was mugged in Hell's Kitchen? <laughs> okay, but it's all by you tonight. So anyway, we'll get to that later. Uh, Vince decided that the beginning of World War II, he needed to get into it. He joined the infantry, and then he saw an airborne presentation. Some paratroopers jumped, and I believe that was 1943. You can correct me if I got that wrong and decided that's what you wanted to do. A little bit extra pay, but all those boots and that uniform they were wearing ends up uh, being sent overseas and arrived in Europe in November of 1944. So you missed D-Day, you missed the Market Garden campaign, but you were there soon enough to get into Bastogne. And that's where the 101st Airborne made its uh, glory, if you will. You were assigned as a machine gunner, I know, to H Company, 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. And you trucked into Bastogne, is that right? After five weeks of airborne training, I made my first jump out of the back of a truck. There you go, okay. <laughs> Vince's story about his World War II experiences is very, very well known, and we'll get into some other ways you can find out more about it. But Vince, we wanted to pick up the story tonight in 2009, 65 years after the battle, and I believe it was in Florida, you encountered somebody there who convinced you that you should go back to Bastogne. And I'm gonna hand it over to you and kind of tell that story and how you ended up going back in 2009. Okay, first let me say this. <clears throat> when I came home from the war, I was 20 years old. I'd been through the will. But as a young boy, I remember reading about the World War I guys who, when they came home from the war, shell shock and uh, nightmares and personality changes had beaten up their wives and so on. And I said to myself, I looked in the mirror at my mother's house when I came home from the war, and I said, listen, you are not gonna be one of those guys who comes home and beats up his kids and uh, you're gonna take all that stuff of cutting people in half with a machine gun and uh, sticking bayonets in people and you're gonna put it in the back of your head, lock the door. You can't forget it, but you can suspend it. And I wanna tell you, Mark, that I was very successful at it. I met a nice woman, got married, kids, I became a school teacher and all of that stuff, the, the war, I buried. I said, you're no longer a soldier, you're an educator now. It was in 1965, uh, 19, uh, 2009 that uh, that changed. 
A woman uh, uh, was uh, waiting on, uh, on, and serving on me on the store, and she had an accent. And I said, Madame, do I denote a French accent? And she said, uh, no, Belgique. I said, oh, Belgium. She said, yes, right. D do you know Belgium? And I said, uh, yeah, bombs, bullets, and snow. Uh, that's what I know about Belgium. And she said, oh, you were there during the war? I said, yeah. She said, with the 101st Airborne Division? I said, yeah. She said, Monsieur, you haven't been back. I said, no. She said, you must go back. The people of Bastogne have never forgotten the 101st Airborne Division. There are monuments to all over town. There, there are speeches. Every year, all the men and women in the town put on American uniforms with a Screaming Eagle patch. They reenact the battle, there are ceremonies. She said, you must go back. And my first reaction was, what for? I spent 65 years trying to forget that stuff. Why, why do I want to go back? And my daughter said, pop the one thing, if nothing else, we should go back and visit the cemetery where your guys are. And, and I said, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yes, I, I should go back one time. And uh, you know, my wife had been taken away, and put permanently in a nursing home. I was an 85-year-old man sitting around waiting to die. But I decided, okay, let's do this one thing. And it changed my life. From an 85-year-old man sitting around waiting to die, <laughs> I'm now a playboy, run the world. <laughs> Meeting all kinds of people and my brass and all kinds of uh, adventures and, and stuff that I, I went back with the intention of just spending three days. My daughter and I were gonna spend three days there. You know, we knew nobody, we had no contacts. I was just gonna rent a taxi and drive out of town and see if maybe I recognized anything. And, uh, and come home, and that'd be the end of it. And I'd put everything back here. It was not to be. The first morning, uh, we were on our way to the bank uh, in Bastogne to exchange our money to uh, euros, and we, my daughter sees a, a mannequin in a window of a 101st Airborne guy in uniform with the, the, the uh, airborne patch. Can we get the and next said, slide, please? Look, I said, yeah, so. She said, let's go look. Now, now here's, the, I'm telling you, my life from there on in, one series of accidental meetings, coincidental events, it just, it, it just seemed like a, an unrelated of events, all organized to get me to do something that I had not wanted to do. The, I said, okay. I could have insisted, you know, I'm the boss in my house. I, I could have insisted, no, let's go to the bank and uh, forget about that. But I didn't. I gave in. We went in there. And it was like a big museum with all kinds of uh, World War II artifacts and stuff. And I said, um, uh, okay, we've seen that. L let's go. Uh, on the way out, I stopped to look at, uh, at a counter with uh, some uh, German uh, belt buckles and helms and this big... I later found out a Dutch paratroop officer comes over, he says, um, perfect English, may I help you, sir? I said, no, nah, I'm just looking, I'm on my way out here. I was here during the war. He said, you were here during the war? I said, yeah. He said, with the 101st Airborne Division? I said, yeah. He came around the counter. I thought he was going to attack me. I went to a defense mode. He picked me up off the floor. Sir, where have you been? There are so few of you left. We, we want to honor you. We want, you know, we studied the war and where everybody, and the 101st Airborne Division. He said, who were you with? I said, H Company, 501, uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. He said, you know, he said, we studied the war. We were know where everybody was, where the battle was. I can take you and show you where H Company was dug in on both sides of the road. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you and your daughter, get in the car. 
So we got in the car, and a friend of his, Johnny Bono, Belgian tank commander, came out, and uh, he drove. Now, I recognized nothing. During the war, of course, everything was covered with snow and so on, and 75 years of growth. Of, I recognized absolutely nothing. But he takes us out to this place, and he says, now, H Company was dug in here, 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 and here, on the other side of the road. Now, you know, they were filled in, but you could see they weren't foxholes. They were foxholes. And then he looks at me and he says, and that was your foxhole. I said, get out of here. I can understand you knowing where H Company was dug in here, but how the hell do you know that was my foxhole? He said, because your company commander, Captain Stanley, when he turned in his after action reports, he had, uh, on a piece of cardboard from a K ration, he had a, a little diagram of where he had put the automatic weapons. You were the only machine gun in the third platoon, right? Yes, sir, the other guy got killed. Okay, this is it, M, G, U. Well, at that moment, all, the, all that stuff that I had put back here hit me in the face. I even heard the artillery again. I got emotional. And my daughter pulled me aside. She said, Marco, listen. My father's seen enough. Let, let's go back. We'll come back tomorrow. So, but let, let's, let's go back to town now. And I said, yeah. On the way back to town, I asked the two guys if I could take them to lunch. They said, sure. At lunch, I ordered three bottles of wine. I said, I don't like the way I'm feeling it. Now we gotta change the mood. <laughs> and uh, well, you put three bottles of wine and three old soldiers together and you know, <laughs> we started getting noisy and uh, we embarrassed the hell out of my daughter. We uh, start telling, and, and they start telling stories. Johnny Bono tells us about Belgian tanks and, and uh, then, Marco tells us about the fighting in Bosnia and Afghanistan. Are these Marco and? Yeah, that's Marco and that's Johnny Bona. Okay, go ahead. And the, the little one in the middle is me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when it came my turn, I told them this story. I said, you know, I said, uh, the first day of the battle in Bastogne, we knocked the hell out of them. No matter what they threw at us, frontal attacks, we stopped them. So the second day, they surrounded us, captured the field hospital with all the blankets, beds, medicine, morphine, equipment. They shot the medical personnel. They, they kept the five, five of our doctors to serve in their armies. One doctor and, and one Belgian nurse escaped and was in the town. For that whole battle, that was our medical team. One doctor, one Belgian nurse, and only his personal equipment. And, and uh, they laid siege to the place. And uh, we had, by the way, the temperature had dropped to zero, below zero. Later on, we don't know it then, but eight below, 10 below, one night, 18 below. It was the worst winter that Europe had had in 20 years. And we had no summer, we had no winter clothes, no gloves, no hats, no nothing. But at any rate, uh, the second day, uh, uh, my buddy got hit. His name is Joe Willis. In his leg, they, they brought him back. We had no place to put the wounded. The church and, and the seminary across the street from the church were the only two places that still had walls. Uh, and the town had been flattened, the Luftwaffe had come in. And, and the, the uh, wounded were just thrown on, on, the, on the floor of the church. You know, the movies show you nice cots and nurses and so on. The floor. And we went through the houses and pulled the uh, drapes and the curtains and bedspreads where we could find to, to wrap the wounded in. Those of us that had two blankets uh, donated one to the wounded. And my sergeant sent me back to, to, to the town. Uh, we were dug in right outside of town to look for batteries uh, for the uh, radios, the walkie-talkies. While I was there, I went to look for my friend. And I see him 
<coughs> laying on the floor of the church. By the way, you know, in the movie, they show you all these guys groaning, moaning. Nay, there wasn't a sound in that church. All those guys were all beat up. Nobody's paying attention to them because there's only one doctor. But uh, you didn't hear any whimpering, any moaning, any nothing. They were just sitting there quiet. Some of them laying with uh, curtains wrapped around their neck. It was a bad scene. It was a bad scene. But I, uh, you know, hey, Joe, how you doing? He said, ah, nothing. A couple of fish wrapping in my leg. I'll be out of here tomorrow. I'll be out of here tomorrow. He said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll be out of here. I said, well, that's great, Joe. I, I got to go. I got to go back. Anything I can do for you before I leave? He says, yeah, go find me something to drink. I said, where the hell am I going to find you something to drink? We're surrounded and cut off. There's no supplies, nothing coming in here. He said, go look at the taverns. Joe, the taverns are all flat and bumped. He said, go look anyway. You might get lucky. I step out. It's snowing. Hard, not the gentle, kind of hits you, cuts your face. And, and, and uh, artillery is dropping in all around the church there, and I'm slopping down the road there looking for a tavern. Uh, the, the first tavern I went in, this story, by the way, has over two million trillion hits on the internet. The first tavern I went in, all broken glass, nothing. <coughs> I got walked down the road a little further. The, the second I went in, had a bar, and when I pulled the, the, the beer handle, beer came out. I said, ooh. Uh, I looked around for a bottle or, or something to put the beer in. There was nothing. I took off my helmet. The same helmet you use in the foxhole, you know. <laughs> I swished a little snow in it. And I filled it up with beer. I went back to the church. I Joe, I got some beer. He said, oh, he, he, he sits up, and I'm pouring beer. Hey, give me some of that. 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 I was like an old mother cow there feeding all these guys a <coughs> mouthful of beer. I ran out. Joe says, go get some more. Gee, I cried, Joe, go get some more. I go down the road again, fill up the helmet. This time when I stepped out the door of the, the tavern, a, a shell landed nearby, concussion knocked me down, and I spilled half of the beer, but I, I wasn't hurt. So I got up, and went back to the church, only this time standing in the doorway like this is the regimental surgeon, Major Walker, and you know, I'm a PFC. He said, what the hell do you think you're doing, soldier? Uh, uh, sir, <laughs> uh, bringing aid and comfort to the wounded? <laughs> he said, you stupid jackass, don't you know I got chest cases and stomach cases and there you give them B, you'll kill them? Get out of here before I have you shot. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And put that helmet on. <sighs> I was not only freezing now, I was wet and freezing, but I ran like hell back to the foxhole before he changed his mind and had me shot. And I, I uh, dismissed it. One of the incidents that happened during the war. You know how many incidents happened during the war? I forgot all about it. While I was telling this story, Johnny and Marco are going like this. You? You were the GI who brought beer and helmet to the... I said, yeah. You, you went to the helmet full of beer in the church to the wounded guys laying on the floor? I said, yeah. They said, man, don't you know you're famous in Europe? I said, what the hell are you talking about? They said, waiter, come here. Bring us four bottles of airborne beer. The waiter comes back, and he's got a tray with four bottles of beer, like this, and four 
little ceramic helmets in the shape of a GI helmet. So there, one served it in. And the label on the bottle of beer shows an American paratrooper with a helmet full of beer going like this. They said, nobody thought that was a true story. <laughs> Everybody thought that was just a myth. That's a, we can't believe it. The guy is really true, and the guy is sitting right in front of us. I said, yeah, maybe I should get a cut on the beer, right? <laughs> he said, uh, no, well, uh, Vincent, uh, we, uh, we, uh, it's a marvel. It's a marvel. When I went home, they gave me six bottles of beer. That other slide you had up there. Yeah. They, they, they gave me six bottles of beer to take home. And the journal register uh, called me and said, hey, we heard a story about you. Could we come and interview you? And I said, yeah. So they come to my house in Auburn. And they had a photographer, too. And they wanted the story. I told them the story. And then the photographer took a picture of me with uh, the beer, the, the one that you saw when, when you first came in, and, and they put it in the, in the newspaper. Somebody from the newspaper took it and put it on the internet. Pew. Today, although I have two Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, Legion of Honor, the medal, I have 15 million medals, I am more famous for what I did with a helmet full of beer than what I did with my machine gun the whole war. That, that story just went crazy. And, and uh, every place I go, I got to tell it. I was, I was at the Pentagon, invited by a general friend of mine. And, and they were gi giving me the tour. They said, we'll start with the secretary of the army, and then the chief of staff, and the assistant chief of staff, and sergeant major, and the commander, all the way down the line, you'll get to shake hands with all of the, all the officers. I said, great. I was in a wheelchair. They, they, they wheeled me into the, the secretary of the army, Murphy. He was just appointed by Trump at that time. And uh, he's outside of his office when I, when, when, when I get wheeled in. And he says, you, come in here. He said, I heard about you. I said, uh, sir, uh, he said, I heard it from other people, but I want to hear it from you. Tell me the beer story. <laughs> <laughs> the secretary of the army. <laughs> Tell me the beer story. Uh, <laughs> OK. And, and you know, when I started traveling around, I, I liked to sing and fool around, so on, but everybody, hey, Vince, tell the beer story. After a while, I said, you know, listen, uh, I'm not an entertainer. I, I, I'm here as a veteran of the battles and so on. Uh, I, I, I didn't do any singing. Or, uh, they said, yes, you did. You brought beer to the wounded in the middle of a fight and, and raised the morale of the wounded. <laughs> At any rate, uh, it's, it's, uh, the story is taken off, and it, it's all over the place now and so on. And, and I... Uh, was on my way to a new career. I started visiting, I'd go to, to the reunions, the 101st Day of Association, I, the 82nd, and, and, and uh, uh, visiting Fort Campbell and so on and so on. And everywhere I went, oh yes, a decorated veteran, tell us the beer story. Okay, okay, we tell the beer story. Before we get to that though, Vince, I'm gonna jump in here, because I wanna lay a little bit more of the background down, how you and I've met. You came out after this trip and after you'd gone out to the World War II uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C. And it was in 2010 and you came to our Optimist meeting. And that's where I first found out about you and, and talking to you. And as I recall, Vince, it took quite a while for me to convince you to actually sit down and tell your story. But since that time, we've had five sessions in the original interview back in 2010, and then another session in 2012. You promised me a two-hour session. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I'm glad well, that I violated fault, that rule. When, you, when you first asked me about the email, I said, uh, yeah, okay. And you said, two-hour session. I said, yeah, okay, two hours. 
And, uh, but then, uh, as a skilled interrogator there, you <laughs> asked the questions that you brought every damn thing out of it. By the end of the first session, I hadn't even gotten out of high school. <laughs> and and, and uh, they, they said, you've got to come back uh, for uh, two more. And the two more, uh, I had just barely gotten into combat. And more and more, and so were the rest of it. But uh, uh, Mark is responsible for uh, launching my career. But after that, then you got a flood of invitations, I know, just all over the place. And I know that in 2010, must have been after we did our interview, you went back to Europe, and I wanted to give you a chance to tell a couple of stories that a lot of people I don't think have heard about. And this one for pictures going to Brighton, England. Can you lay out the background for that story? Because I think that's every bit as fascinating as, as okay. the beer story. We went overseas in the Queen Mary. It had been converted to a troop ship. And got to England in November and uh, flown to France uh, near the end of November as the 101st Airborne Division was coming out of Market Garden, out of Holland. And the division was supposed to get 90 days of rest, recuperation, replacements, ammunition, food, replenish all the supplies, and half of the weapons that they uh, were supposed to, that, that they had to leave in, in uh, Holland when the Germans almost took them over. And so, uh, I, you know, when you're a replacement in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a, an experienced outfit, you are nothing. Nobody talks to you. Uh, we expected that. We were told. They said, listen, what do you expect when a combat guy whose buddy just got killed and he sees you, you you're going to take his friend's place, you're going to be as good as Louis was and so You know, they, they, they look at you as nothing. And in, in fact, uh, in the beginning, you're cannon fodder. They send you out with the, to save one of their own. But you, we didn't blame them. We understood it. Until you prove yourself in combat, you are nothing. Once you do, then you can't find the, the, the envelope that you're in now with all these guys and so on. Uh, I'm, I must have done very well in my first combat because they, they nicknamed me Curse and Traverse Speranza. Uh, uh, they said, you know, I wasn't aware of it, they said, all you did, we never heard such cursing in our whole lives. We think you invented some new ones. <laughs> but you let those three second bursts just right, you were mowing them down as the snow turned red. And, and uh, you know, you, you're one of the boys. As soon as you proved yourself in combat, then you can't find better buddies. And, and um, I, I went back a couple of times to, um, uh, visit uh, the museum there and so on. And there was a young singer. Uh, her name was uh, Kellyanne Sproul. That's leading up to the story. There no, she the, is. The one before that. And, and she, um, she was known as the, the uh, sweetheart of the British Armed Forces. And she uh, uh, sang the, the World War II song. The old song. And she was very nice. And um, her mother was her manager and so on. And I'm sitting here with him, and unbeknown to me, her, the line from her microphone was under my chair as it went up. And uh, so she's sitting there belting the song, and I get up, <laughs> and without realizing it, I unplugged her microphone. <laughs> so there she is, singing away, and nobody <laughs> hears her. <anything. laughs> of course, afterward, I apologized and so on, and uh, I took her and her mother to dinner and so on. And uh, they invited me to come to England. So I went to, uh, I, I did, I went to visit. And uh, they were driving me around, showing me the old places that uh, I mentioned while, while I was in England. I was here, there, and the other place. And we went by this one place that I sort of got some kind of recognition. Of. I said, was that a tavern there? She says, yes, it, it still is. She said, it's a very old tavern. It's from uh, uh, World War II. So I looked a little closer and I said, you know, I said, I think this is the tavern where 
my buddies and I are in town, uh, you know what we're looking for. And uh, people said, uh, not the pub, the pub the old men go to. If you want to meet the ladies, you got to go to the dance halls uh, down below there. So we went down to the dance halls and, oh yes, there was plenty of ladies there. But we ended up the night, three guys and only two women. So I magnanimously said, uh, go ahead boys, I'll go back to the tavern and have a drink and wait for you. Well, I went back to the tavern, but they never came back. We need to it see the picture of the tavern here. We were roaring, drinking, and, and, and appeasing the British with drinking their uh, ale with a hot poker in it and so on. And, and the, the story, the, the, the stories came out later that uh, I was leading them in song the, that I knew it's a long way to Tipperary. And uh, about four o'clock in the morning, I, I, I felt pretty good, but as <laughs> soon as you step outside into the cold, now you really, you keep staggering, you can't even walk. And I got jumped on by three or four guys. They called them young toughs in England. They beat the hell out of me. They took my watch and my pass and my, my, my wallet, and that had my pass in it, and um, left me laying in the alley there. And I, I woke up a little bit later, I guess, and I didn't know where I was or what I was gonna do and so on. It's getting daylight and, and uh, I walked out, uh, the path of least resistance was downhill. I walked downhill to a bench. And, and I sat down on the bench. And I just sit there, you know, I don't have a pass. No. As soon as the MPs come around, I'm gonna be AWOL, they're gonna prick me in, put me in the jail. And I just shaking my head, and here comes this old Englishman walking around with a dog. And as he walks by and he looks at me, and then he looks again, he says, I saw Yank, are you all right? I said, no. Considering your guys beat the hell out of me, took my money, my pass, and my watch, and so on, and I don't know how I'm gonna get back to the camp. He was horrified. Oh, Vince, he said, I'm so sorry. I feel bad. He said, uh, please, come to me. My, I live right up there. Come to my house. My wife will clean your uniform, and lift you up, and, we'll, and I'll get you back uh, to the camp. So I said, sure, <laughs> anything to get off the road. I went to the house, and I'm telling you, those people must have saved up, must have used their saved up rations for a month. They put a dinner on there with, the, uh, what do you call that flaming, uh, uh, whatever it is, it's a flaming dessert with, with uh, they put uh, whiskey on it. So, and uh, she cleaned my uniform and everything else. And he took me back uh, in his car to where the trucks picked us up to bring us back to camp. So I didn't get into any trouble. And uh, I thanked them. Uh, the next day I got the sergeant to give me a whole bunch of tea and stuff and I brought it to their house and so on. And we stayed in touch for a while. But in 2010, I went back and Kelly Ann Sproul took me to these places again, where I could see the, the bench where I sat and the, the um, uh, tavern, which was still there, and still operating. You had a picture there, didn't you? And, and um, well, then she and I were friends for a long time after that. We met at other times, but uh, that was my reintroduction to England, and I reminded them that one day I saw the best they had to offer and the worst those guys that uh, took on an American GI. Now, what you've got up there now, uh, Mark, is something different. Are you talking about the Govers? During the, yes, yeah, Dr. Govers. The next uh, slide here. You know, th these stories have to be a little disjointed. I try to give a little background to how they fit together, but uh, I can't do it. Uh, they're, they're different episodes. The, th this one, there was a, uh, a bombing attack, uh, probably the third day of the battle there in Bastogne, and they really finished flattening everything. 
And I'm, I'm walking through the town there, uh, and, and I see these uh, four people standing on the sidewalk, the two men uh, the, and, the, and, and two women and, and a child, five. They, they're crying, and they're standing there looking. And I went up to them, and they said, look, this was my house, you know, with all the flats. I said, well, I said, you know, a lot of the civilians tried to get out of the town before it was surrounded, but they couldn't get out. So they were stuck in their, in their basements and so on. And so he said, uh, he was a doctor. And I said, well, I said, listen, I said, um, I'll help you get some of the debris, debris out of the way. You better get down to the basement. This artillery is going to go on all day. And so they sort of revived a little bit. We went down. We pulled some of the debris out of the way so they could get in the basement. And I, uh, I gave the men a, a cigarette and so on. And, and, and uh, I had a piece of the chocolate D bar we used to have. I gave it to the kid. And I said, don't worry about it, they said. The Germans are coming back, aren't they? So I said, no, this is the 101st Airborne Division. They will not come back into this town. He said, <laughs> and they said, Vincent, uh, uh, where do we go for, uh, can we get water or food? Will the army, I said, I, I don't know about that. You go, go talk to somebody else. But I said to the doctor, I said, listen, we could use you. He said, uh, I, I don't have any instruments. I said, well, you go up there. I'm sure that they'll be able to use you. So he went to the, uh, to the church there where our doctor was, and he helped out for the rest of the war. And each day that I was in town, I would go back and if I had talked to the sergeant out of a can of beans or something, and uh, one time a can of fruit and some uh, dried peas and stuff, and I'd give them what, what, I could, what I could find, and uh, a pack of cigarettes, which they wanted more than the, almost the food. And so um, I, I uh, you know, befriended them, and they, they were very grateful about it. And uh, at the end of the, that battle, I never saw them again. And Oh, no, the, the, the one incident that stands out is Christmas. Christmas Day, I uh, uh, found some stuff in one of the stores, uh, like necklaces and things there, and, and I uh, took uh, two pieces of uh, parachute cloth, a yellow <laughs> parachute cloth. I wrapped uh, two packs of cigarettes each for the two men, I found uh, a necklace and uh, the bracelet and thing there for the women, and a coloring book and crayons for the, the child, uh, Anne Marie. She was 12. And they never got over it. Christmas, the middle of the battle, da, 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 here comes this GI with his helmet. He's got presents for Christmas. I wished him a Merry Christmas, and I went back. And I never saw them again. This is the museum in, in Bastogne. And I'm in the museum there, it's, uh, what, 2012, 2012, 13, somewhere in there. And while I'm talking to the Johnny Boner there in the museum and so on, this guy walks in and he says uh, to me, are, are you Vincent? I said, yeah. He said, Vincent, who was here during the, the battle? I said, yeah. He said, I'm Dr. Gauvet, Jr. He said, my father and mother, do you have the other picture? That's them. My father and mother were here in Bastogne during the war. And they, and suddenly he starts crying. And he says, My father passed away 11 years ago, he said, but before he died, he told me, go get the blue bag out of the closet drawer uh, here. And he 
I bring him the blue bag, and he said, you see these two pieces of parachute cloth? They say, Merry Christmas from Vincent. He said, you must find Vincent. He said, he, all the stories I told you about during the war, that's GI that helped us and so on, this is who it was. He said, I have not been able to locate him, uh, to thank him once again for our family that we made it through the war. But he said, I want you to be sure to do it. And I, you know, I'm overcome already. <laughs> And, and, and then he pulls out the two pieces of yellow parachute cloth that say, Merry Christmas from, from, from Vincent. And uh, he hugs me and, uh, you know, I'm an old man now. Emotionalism is getting too much, but it was an episode that it, it touches the heart, you know, and, and, and you, you can't believe that one of the reasons I started going back to all these is the sincerity of the people there when they when they look at you in the eye and thank you for what you did. You know, maybe the governments didn't get along well, but the people there have never forgotten the Americans and what the American soldiers did uh, during World War II to preserve uh, some semblance of civilization there when when the war was over. And I, I, uh, I kept going back for more when I realized how much it meant to them. They, and you know, and everyone will take a picture with you and so on. What have you got there now? Well, I know that well, you've always I've gone back for D-Day and Market Garden and the Battle of the Bulge every single year, right? Mm. Let me read you a poem that I wrote. about the Battle of the Bulge, my first day in combat. I said, by the way, I've never written a poem in my life. Just one day when I'm getting ready to make a speech, as I was thinking about it the night before, some of the things, uh, phrases started rhyming in my head, and I just I said, well, yeah, I sat down at the thing then. It was December of 1944 the 18th to be exact, when the hungry, tired soldiers did pour from off the trucks with their packs and told to dig a hole in the frozen ground. And it was cold, cold, cold. The wind blew through their summer clothes and feet froze through and through, but these were paratroopers all and given a job to do. No weather was gonna stop these boys. And we waited and waited and waited. We checked and checked and checked our guns. Our fingers were stiff and sore. The enemy was near, we knew. Get ready, sight that boar. Put a round in the chamber and click it home. And we stamped and stamped and stamped our feet. The experienced calmly lit a butt and cupped it in their hand. The young kid with the machine gun just hoped that he could stand. They all gave him the thumbs up. You'll make it, little man and you force a smile while your mouth runs dry. The fog and the mist begin to rise, daylight comes at last, stirrings from the other side, and artillery comes whizzing past. Not yet, not yet, not yet, said the lieutenant, and our fingers were sticking to the triggers. And then the sound we dreaded most, the clank of treads and wheel, the 88 grinds to a halt, and the tanks belch red hot steel, and fear begins to clutch the heart, and you shiver, but you blame the cold. The enemy starts across the field, white snow capes frustrate our aim. Lieutenant, goddammit, they're coming on, are we just playing a game? Not yet, not yet, not yet, says he, and the wind blows swirls and swirls of snow. The machine gun kid hears not the din, waiting only for word or plan, his thoughts exploding again and again. Would the kid become a man? He sets his sights at 400 yards and squints through the peephole. And the figures get larger as they come on and on. 
Now, now, now the command, hoarsely through the noise. My gun erupts, I grin and shout, and curse, traverse, and curse. My fear is gone, replaced by joy, as I watch the figures fall. Joy, I don't know. The snow turns red with blood, and the enemy falters, stops, and turns back. No victory cries or shouts of glee as we all turn around and view the bodies of our boys lying upon the ground. Oh, the cost, the cost of that day's work lies heavily on the brow. The mighty Airborne 101 is less in numbers now. But we stopped them cold, though odds of seven to one, no Nazi boot ever entered Bastogne. And the machine gun kid had indeed become a man. We the living seek not the glory, only realization of our terrible losses. Save your honored prayers and praise for brave men neath rows of crosses. Respectfully submitted. Vince, I suspect that put all this out of your mind until 2009, and then your comrades would be so proud of the way you're carrying on their tradition and bringing their memories to life again. Uh, unfortunately, when you're an old man, you, you don't have the control you used to have. You know, I, I uh, it was down. But they asked me about Memorial Day, uh, Veterans Day today. And, uh, well, well, what are your feelings? In fact, it's supposed to be on, I did a clip for Martin McCallum, Fox News Day. What, what, do, you, what do you think about on Veterans Day? Happy, happy Veterans Day. I said, no. Veterans Day brings on a sadness to me. A sadness that, that uh, always brings me back to those views, those scenes of so much death and destruction, and, and it doesn't seem to be going any better today. And, and that uh, we thought at the end of World War II, man, we've finally done it now. We've stopped the dictators. The world is uniting in the United Nations. The, the uh, United States is big and powerful and ready to help the whole world get back on its feet, which it did. And, and maybe, really, there's going to be a little peace on Earth. And of course, not a year afterwards, the communists started, and it's all going down. And, and you wonder, I wonder today, is it ever going to change? Or, as uh, Jefferson said, the tree of liberty needs to be watered by blood every generation. I, uh, I hope not, but you know, we've had some wars, but they're not real big wars. But uh, if the big one comes, whew, I, uh, I hope somebody's still around to celebrate Veterans Day. At any rate, let uh, me uh, let me turn I the direction here. I started being invited to the army camps. Yeah, and I wanted to give you an opportunity because we're going to run out of time here, even though it's nobody's ready to kick you off. That's the stage for sure. But I wanted you to tell your efforts to make a solo parachute jump, and how that has worked okay. out for you. Mm -hmm. I was 80 years old. And I said, yeah, I can't live much longer than 80. My parents died in their 70s. And all that. I said, you know, before I die, I would like to make it one more jump. And I started thinking about it and asking around and thinking about it. But and then one day at a 101st Airborne Association meeting, there's a sign that there'll be a jump today. And I said, for anybody? They said, I don't know, it doesn't say anything <laughs> special, go look. So I went down and talked to the, the, the uh, guys in charge. I said, uh, can anybody sign? They said, uh, yeah, uh, but you have to pass the test. 
I said, what are the tests? They said, can you do three push-ups? I did 10. Can you climb uh, a rope L-shaped with uh, at least five feet? I climbed 10. Can you do a PLF, you know, parachute landing fall? I said, get out of the way. <laughs> all the young kids, you know, they were all gathered around waiting for the old gray head to make a fool of himself. I did a PLF that everybody had to clap. They, they all clapped. The, the jump master said, this man's ready to jump. My dream was coming true. I'm going to make a static line jump, just like I did when I was an 18-year-old kid. And we get to the airport. I have my parachute. I have my jump position. And we're all sitting there waiting. The loudspeaker, no jump today. The ceiling is too low. But come back tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, everything is going to be okay. The weather's right. There will be a jump tomorrow morning. That night, my jump master gets a phone call. Everybody can jump tomorrow except Speranza. He's over 80. I, I, I just was flabbergasted. Where the hell do you come up with a figure like I passed all the tests better than the young kids? And I wasn't much over 80, I was 89. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but that, that should not make any difference. Uh, you know, the, the tests are designed to see, can you make a jump? Well, to make a long story short, they cut me out. I could not jump that day. They offered me a tandem jump. I said, get out of here, that's not a jump. I said, a tandem jump, you're a message on a passenger pigeon's leg going out the door. <laughs> And they said, well, that's all, that's all. You know, I had to eat those words because that's all I could get. Later on, uh, I got a, a tandem jump. But I want to read you a, a poem that I wrote after I got turned down out of that jump. It's called An Old Paratrooper's Lament. <laughs> and uh, I, I smiled and laughed at myself at the window saying, what, what has come of the American paratrooper when he gets even with somebody by writing a poem. <laughs> Maybe. I thought I had it. Here. No, that's, that's, not, that's not the one. Maybe I don't have it. I guess not. So you're not able to find that, Vince? Huh? You're not able to find that? Do you have another one you can read, or? Oh, it's, no, it's not in the book. There's only the first three in the book. Um, well, you know what this means if you can't find it, Vince. You're going to have to come back another time. <laughs> <laughs> well, at any rate. Tell us about this picture that we see over here. On the All right, I, I am claiming the world's first selfie. Because there was no such thing, and yet that is in 1945. What happened was, um, at the end of the war, they broke up the 101st Airborne Division. Right after, the war was over in May, in June. Don't ask me what the politics of the world was. All of a sudden, they said the 101st Airborne Division is now being abolished, and they took all the high point men from the 82nd and the 101st, they sent them home, and they put the young kids in the uh, uh, 82nd Airborne, and they uh, uh, said that um, we are going to have a uh, practice jump. And we said, practice? What the hell for? The war's over. Um, with full field equipment. What they had decided to do was they were going to 
fly us from France to Panama to Saipan for the invasion of Japan. You know, that war looked like it was going to last another three years. The closer we pushed the Japanese back to their home island, the tougher they got. And, and, and we, just, we just couldn't believe it. We'd never survive another combat. We said, don't you have enough guys there already? What the hell, you can take us from here and bring us over there to fight. And uh, I realized my mother really didn't have any pictures of, of me since I'd, I'd been overseas. So I decided I would, I would take some pictures to send her so that she'd have something. I'm sure I'm going to get killed in the Pacific. And, and uh, I had, uh, you know, the little box cameras, the, the kind you have to roll the, the film. And, um, you know, against the rules, of course, I jumped with the, the, the camera. <laughs> and as soon as I got out of the plane and the chute opened, I took a picture of the guys above me, picture of the guys below me, and then just for the hell of it, I turned the camera like this, and I went, that's me in the air coming down. Uh, and I don't know of anybody who has taken a selfie like that since then, so I claim the world's first selfie, 1945. How many tandem jumps have you made since you got started? Three. Three. I, I made one in Holland with uh, the round canopy uh, parachute uh, unit. And I made one with Mike Elliott, who was a former Golden Knights uh, out of Fort Bragg. And uh, the last one I made with the Golden Knights, uh, you saw. Oh, that one, that, that, that's the Fort Bragg one. But in each case, I ate my words about a, a, a tandem jump. It, it is a, a thrilling thing. It's the same, you know, except that instead of jumping at 900 feet and as soon as you shoot them, you hit the ground, you're up 10, 12,000 feet and you sail down and you can see the ground and everything. And, and, and uh, of course, you come in cushioned by the, guy, the other guy who's jumping <laughs> with you, and he takes all the shots. And for you, it's just one pleasant thrill, and, and I, I will make one every chance I get. Well, that sure looks like you had fun after you landed on the ground. And I was watching the whole uh, the, the video of you coming down. It looked like you had a beautiful view. Oh, man, it was beautiful. Uh, a tandem jump is a very nice thing. And uh, they ask me, um, how do you feel? It's always the same. You don't get used to parachute jumping. You don't get used to it. Everyone is a wonderful thrill. They said to me, which part of the jump do you like the best? I said, going out the door. <coughs> when you're going out the door, if you go out the door, well, you've met the first and most important challenge. Only one or two things can happen. You're going to smash yourself into a million pieces, or your chute's going to open, and you're going to have a nice descent. Once you're willing to do that, hey, man, everything else <laughs> is uh, fun. And, and uh, I, I feel the same way. When, when, when you experience it for the first time, it's just as good the, the 10th time or the, or the 12th time. Uh, it's, uh, well, since you uh, were there in 2009, I think you will agree that your life has transformed in ways you couldn't even imagine, and you've become something of celebrity. So I've got a, this next picture right here. I've got to tell you that last year for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, I personally was not surprised when I got my Wall Street Journal in the morning on the 7th and looked to see well, your picture right on the front page. Yeah. Well... Hey, you know, I thank God that I'm still able to move around enough to try. You can't know what this virus has done to me. All my things are canceled. I can't go here, I can't go there. Two in October, three in November, my December ones are all canceled. I may not even get to Bastogne this year. And I've been to Bastogne every year since 2009. But, uh, yeah. I think what I'd like to do here then, Vince, is play a video 
and the video illustrates just how much you are now embraced by the military community across the world. And then we're going to open up to the audience and let them ask you some questions. And you know what video I'm going to go here, so let's go ahead and bring that on up. You're going to have to click it again. There we go. Is everybody happy? Cried the sergeant looking up. Our hero bravely answered yes, and then they stood him up. He jumped right out into the blast, his static line on hook. He ain't gonna jump no more. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. On the risers, there were brains upon the chute. Intestines were a hanging from his paratroop of shoot. They picked him up, still in the chute, and poured him from his boots. He ain't gonna jump no more. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, I had glory, the whole class at West Point. And home and to his wife and baby son Madam, we regret to say your trooper's life is done But hold your head up high His name is written in the sky He ain't gonna jump no more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die son grew up and said a trooper's life for me a jumper like my daddy was is all i want to be i only hope that i can jump just half as well as he he ain't gonna jump no more Sent him to Afghanistan and then into Iraq. The bullet that came speeding out went deep into his back. He hit the ground, but his grenade found enemy on track. He ain't gonna jump no more. Vince is pretty me, obvious me, going me, through there. Just say one thing about that, that song. I don't know when I started singing it. Uh, you know, it was after I started going back to Europe and, and so on. But uh, I only remembered the first two stanzas. Now, I was too stupid to know that you could get on the internet and find the lyrics to anything. But uh, I, So I just made up three of my own. I, made up, I added three stanzas to it. Now, I'm not singing it for, uh, at, at an entertainment event. My buddies and I, when we're sitting around talking, fool around, I, I, I sing this song. And uh, people take a, a video clip and they put it on, on YouTube. Now, I don't know that, that they're doing that. But at any rate, it starts to go around. And uh, about a year later, I'm in Normandy with a bunch of guys and so on and so on. And these people come up and said, they said, you know, you're not singing that song, right? That's not... That's not the, uh, uh, the, the Blood on the Rises song. 
I said, I know. I said, uh, I, uh, I couldn't remember more than the first two stanzas, so I, I made up three of my own. They said, uh, yeah. So I said, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll start singing the official version. All my friends said, no, nah, we like your version better. <laughs> the original Blood on the Rises makes the guy a damn fool. You make him a hero. We like you. So I started singing. Uh, now, I don't know if I've broken any rules or anything, but, you know, I'm not selling the song. or whatever. It's just when people and I get together, they love to hear that. So we sing my version of it. And uh, I guess someday I'll get arrested for plagiarism <laughs> or something, but... Uh, no one's going to have the I'm guts innocent. to arrest you, Vince. <laughs> I, 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 I meant no harm to anybody, and I certainly am not trying to commercialize it. But this video, what it shows, to me at least, is that everywhere you go, you are bringing a little bit of joy and an awful lot of pride to these young men and women who are wearing the uniform today, and that's something to be proud of. And I think as we get ready to turn over to the audience, can you hold up a, a copy of your book so you can talk about that a little bit? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was, I was telling this gentleman here, for years, my family was after me, Pop, you should write a book, you should write a book. I said, get out of here. What makes you think I can write a book? You've got to have talent to write a book. There are people that go to college for four years to learn how to write a book. And I said, I, I don't have it. And I put them off for years that way. Finally, one year, <laughs> when I was 89 years old, my daughter said, listen, Pop, when you talk to people and you tell them stories, they all sit there fascinated. They really listen to what you have to say. Just tell a story. Well, I clicked in here immediately. Of course, I don't have to invent anything or make up anything. I just sit down and talk, tell my story. And at that time, there was a new uh, computer uh, application that, that uh, called Dragon Naturally Speaking. You talk and the computer types it out. Well, <laughs> you know, if I had to type it, it would have never got done. But all I had to do was sit there, tell my story, and the computer printed it all out. I divided it into chapters and all that. Um, how long did you struggle with rewrites and editing and this? Three weeks. Wrote this book in three weeks. Five, five, five days, no, six days a week. I took Sundays off. Four hours every morning, uh, Monday through Saturday. And three weeks later, I had a book and I divided it into chapters and uh, just went over it one time. I, by the way, no editing, no changing, really. whatever the first thing was, that, that was it, and that, that's what came out. And, and, uh, and I used to laugh at myself. Who the hell do you think you're gonna write and read a book like that? And uh, I sent it to a publisher. They said, how, how long did you pound the pavement looking for a publisher to uh, first time out, unknown author, and, uh, an old man, an 89 year old man. The first publisher I sent it to, Deeds Publishing Company out of Atlanta, I got a phone call. I said, Mr. Spranza, yes, I want to publish your book, but I've only read the first two chapters. Wait till I finish reading the rest of the book and I'll send you a contract. <laughs> he did. He said, now, he said, you know, you could expect to sell 180, 200 books a year. That can, yeah. First year we sold 1,500. The second year, 1,400. Third year, 1,600. And, and right now it's on, uh, you know, uh, Amazon.com and there's other people and so on and so on. And I, I sell them out of my home too as well. And it won a prize, the, the Indie Book Awards uh, uh, out, of, out of New York, the uh, Harvard Book Club. So an 89-year-old can still write a book. Okay, let's turn it over to the audience. And Joe, I su I'm sure you got a couple questions that have been sent in. Some questions at this point. Uh, those of you watching, if you have a question for Vince, uh, please uh, post them in the comments. But we've had more than a number 
of, uh, of comments as opposed to questions. Uh, basically, Vince, thanking you for your service, thanking you for bringing history to life. In fact, one of the best comments that we got uh, earlier tonight, as you were telling some of the stories, uh, from Susan in Sherman said, Vince is amazing. He makes some of the scenes in Band of Brothers even more vivid, and that is quite a statement. Do we have any questions okay. from the small group we got here? Let me give a moment or two for some folks if they have a question to uh, chime in from our uh, audience watching uh, around the state, around the country. But again, just lots of comments, several people commenting on the uh, great Loving the Beer story, time. the uh, fabulous and beautiful poem uh, that you read. Uh, so again, thank you for that. And we do have, as you mentioned, Mark, a, uh, a very small uh, in-person audience of invited uh, friends and family of uh, Vince and Dr. DePew. Uh, is there anyone here in our audience that would like to uh, ask a question of Vince before uh, we wrap it up? Well, you know, I make my living asking questions. Yes. <laughs> Vince, in 2009, when you first went back to Bastogne, would you could have imagined what has happened to your life after that? Absolutely not. I, I, I honestly saw myself as an 85, and 85, hell, that's old enough. I, a lot of people don't make it to 75. And, and I didn't expect to make it to 75. I said, my wife is gone, I'm, a, I'm alone, there's nothing to do. That's enough. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't do anything foolish, but I was an old man sitting around downhill. I, 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 I'd, done, I'd done my thing, by the way. I was, I, I was not ashamed of my, my life. I, I felt successful and so on. Uh, as a school teacher and so on. And, and the accidental meeting with that lady who told me about the celebrations in Bastogne changed my life completely. I am now, you know, 85 on the way down. All of a sudden, <laughs> I'm 95 now, no? I can't even wrap my head around that number. 95, what the hell is that? <laughs> we, I, do, uh, <laughs> we do have a question uh, for you, Vince. I, uh, Patrick I, and Rebecca want to uh, know, uh, uh, you had mentioned the different uh, medals that you've received. They wanted to know, how did you earn your Purple Heart? Uh, you know, it's not a question of earning it. You... Uh, <laughs> Uh, January 5, we had broken out of Bastogne, and a uh, uh, January, uh, that was in December, uh, January 1, 2, January 2nd, the 501 had to go uh, into the uh, Bojacks woods to clean out the Germans there who were now retreating, going back to Germany, and um, the My company, H Company, had to go across an open field. There was snow all over the place, of course. And uh, the snow slows you down. You know, if you make a dash across an open field, uh, you've got a chance. But an open field that's uh, open to them, too, uh, on the way over a mortar attack. And, uh, you know, you hate mortar attacks more than everything, more than art artillery. You can hear it, and you've got a second or two to move. Mortars are silent. You don't hear it until the first shell drops. And then it's a pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. A good German mortar squad could keep 16 shells in the air at one time, and you don't hear a thing until they start exploding in that pattern. Anybody in the area is gonna get it, and I was one of those, I got it. And, and I, uh, I didn't think I got it bad, you know, pieces of shrapnel were on, 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 one, on one side, but a, a piece had gone uh, un, under my eye, and when they pulled me back, they thought it might be touching the brain, so they shipped me to, uh, they flew me to England, 
uh, to a British hospital, and it wasn't. It wasn't touching it. They pulled it out. No problem. I only stayed in the hospital six days. Oh, and then they gave us. Uh, when, if you're a wounded person, uh, uh, doing the one in the hospital, uh, and when you get out before you have to report to your unit, they give you seven days recuperation leave. Any place in the United Kingdom. But oh, and by the way. Am, am I going over too much now? <laughs> well, I'm afraid you're going to tell that one joke. All right. I, 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 I don't want you to go there. I think my, that might be a little bit risque my, for this, this audience. My, my, um, the next day, I'm, I'm in the hospital. I'm ready to be discharged the next day. And, and uh, the nurses there, you know, they're, they're, the British nurses were so good. And uh, we used to fool around, pinch their bottom and so on. They'd move out of range. And she smiled at me and she said, Listen, she said, you know, there's another one of you naughty paratroopers on the second floor. I said, no kidding. She said, yeah. I said, do you know his name? She said, Joe. I said, not, not Joe Willis. She said, yeah, Joe Willis from Florida. I said, Joe. I said, can I go see him? She said, no. <laughs> as soon as she went down the hall, I went to see him. <laughs> Joe, what the hell he do? He said, the next day, right after you got hit, I got hit. He said, and he said, hey, he said, you know, he said, when we get out of here, they're going to give us seven days recuperation leave. And, you know, the war's still on. We're going back to the war. We're going to do it right, man. He said, we're going to we'll go to Scotland. I said, oh, that's great. He said, when do you get out? I said, tomorrow. He said, no, I don't get out till Thursday. You go back and tell them you're still sick. I went back, I said, oh, you, my hip still, if you, the nurse starts laughing. She says, I know, you can't get out till your buddy gets out Thursday, right? And I said, uh, yeah. She said, don't worry, the doctors will cooperate. It's in the book. I don't have time to tell it tonight. I'd like to tell it, but. Well, I got to give him a we teaser were... to check out our website and to listen to the whole interview, so. Okay. Well, the, 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 when we left Scotland, the, the ladies were saying, oh, Vincent, Scotland will never be the same without you <laughs> naughty paratroopers. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we managed to get our hands. Uh, but, by the way, you know, only officers got a liquor ration. When, when Joe and I got to uh, take our recuperation leave there, we wanted to find something to drink. You could not buy a bottle any place. They'll sell you a drink at the bar, but they won't sell you a bottle. We offered them double. No, we offered them triple. No, I will lose my license. I'll never be. Blah, 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 blah. And so finally, the last guy says to us, "Listen, laddies," he says, "You know the Johnny Walker factory is right down on the River Clyde and in, in Edinburgh." And we said, "The Johnny Walker factory, Scotch, right?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "Go at night with the night watchman. You might get lucky." Well. We put a whole bunch of cartons of cigarettes. You know, we would gotten a lot of cigarettes on, on, on our leave. And we went down to the, and here comes the old Scott, you know, black watch, the skirt there. And before we even got to the, he said, Lottes, he said, I know what you're after, but I cannot help you. He said, it's all ration. We said, oh, we know, but we, we, we heard you were a combat man. You in North Africa, and we just want to talk. We put two cartons of cigarettes on the table. He looked, he said, look, he said, you're tempting me, he said, but I cannot do it. Each box is numbered and it's on a manifest and we cannot sell it. I said, yeah, but you know, we put two more cartons of cigarettes on there. <laughs> and he says, um, you, uh, we thought maybe um, you could find a broken box. And he said, uh, no, nah. the last carton of cigarettes I put on the table was Chesterfield. And he looked at that and he said, Chesterfield, my favorite cigarette. <laughs> Let me see what I can do. And he goes in and he comes out with a whole box of Johnny Walker. Twelve bottles. And he opens the box to take a bottle out. We said, oh, you don't have to bother. We'll, we'll open it. We put the rest of our cigarettes on the table. Took the box and took off. We were the kings of Scotland for the next five days. <laughs> Everywhere we went, all we had to do was put a bottle of Johnny Walker on the table. And all eyes, uh, the ladies too, would you like to, mm, they come running. 
And then there's a story of a, of a young Scott who had looked under his skirt and <laughs> and we, we, uh, we had a great time, and uh, when, we, 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 when we left the hospital, we were supposed to go to a replacement depot, and you know, a replacement depot does not have to send you back to your own outfit. They can send you any place. The doctors there could say, no, you're too bad shape, go home, and so on. And we said, we're not having any of that. We're not going to any replacement depot. We hitched a ride with the 8th Air Force from London to, to France, and uh, we asked about where the 101st Airborne was, and they said, well, they're on the check border there. So we uh, found a Jeep nobody wanted, and we uh, took and, and, and drove out and, and rejoined our outfit in time for the rest of the war. But uh, our sojourn in Scotland gave us weeks to talk about it <laughs> to, 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 the, to the guys. We had, we had such fun. And, and uh, we were, well, the whole story's in the book. Yeah. And Vince, what we, have a, we have a couple <laughs> of more quick questions or comments. Uh, uh, one person in particular here, Hugh, says, I understand Vince often has a general as an aide. Can this be true? I guess what? they appreciate that an enlisted man has a general as an aide. That apparently when you go to all these different functions and events, there's a general who is acting as your aide. Oh, um, I was a school teacher. I taught history in New York City, high schools. And, and um, I, I got an email one time. This was 2004. You know, I'm already retired. I'm in Illinois instead of New York. And so on. I said, Miss Franza, we're having your, your history class of 1964 is, is having a reunion. And uh, we want you to come, we'll buy you. I said, no, I got family there, I'll buy my own ticket. I'll, I'll take care of it. Yes, I would like very much to come. Now here are these kids that I knew at age 18. That's when I left them. They are now all 58 years old. It was the 40th reunion, the senior citizens. And I go to there now and uh, there are these kids, uh, ah, Miss Prince, remember me? I was in your class. I said, yeah, give me a hint. You know, it's been 40 years. But one guy that comes up to me says, Mr. Franz, you remember me, Buzz Altshuler, I was in your history class. Uh, I said, uh, remind me, Buzz. He said, you said, you remember when you did World War II in the history course, you brought in that big army trunk with all the German gas masks and helmets and Nazi banners and so on. I said, oh yeah, I did that in all the classes. He said, well, man, he said, you inspired me. He said, when I graduated, I went to West Point. And he said, I graduated lieutenant, and then I joined your old outfit, the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam. He said, I did two tours, and got hit in the head, and they promoted the captain. And I said, oh, well, that's great, Buzz. I said, uh, what are you doing now? He said, I'm still in. And I said, at 58? I said, where are you? He said, Fort Bragg. I said, well, what do you do there? He said, I'm the commanding general, and I want you to come out and talk to my young troopers and so on and so on and so on. I did. I went out there and made, we talked to the old kids and so on and so on. When I got finished, he said, uh, he still calls me Mr. Speranza. Mr. Speranza, uh, uh, are you going to uh, Bastogne? I said, yeah. He said, uh, may, I, may I accompany you as your aide de camp? <laughs> I said, a private with a general for his aide de camp. I said, we're going to be the odd couple. And we... <laughs> he did. We went to Boston. He came. My aide de camp, everybody went. <laughs> we... I, I, I tried to get him to wear his general stars, but he wouldn't do it. Or uh, get, he didn't have with him his own. But whatever the story was, we were the, really the odd couple, the, the private with, with the, the general as, as, a, as an aide de camp. And uh, by the way, what a wonderful guy he is, General Al Schulis. And I, we visited, you know, so he came to my 90th birthday party. and. Uh, he and his wife are fans of mine on, on Facebook. I have a, a Facebook page, and 
I got a letter from uh, Facebook uh, a couple of, well, more than, probably a year back. Uh, Miss Franza, you can't have any more, you know, I used to, anybody ask for friendship, I just said, conferring, yeah. And, and uh, they said, you can't have any more, you got 5,000 and that's the limit. And I didn't know I had 5,000 and I didn't know that there was any limit. I said, okay, that's the story. But uh, some people drop off, uh, so every once in a while I can still put a, a friend on, but uh, there's a limitation. And, and that, that's the story of my former student, general, who came to Boston with me as my aide de camp. Wow. And one last uh, question, uh, Jeff wants to know, did you end up going to this, to the, you had mentioned uh, uh, about doing your jump as they were getting ready to go to the Pacific Theater. Did you actually end up in, in, in the Pacific Theater before the end of the war? Wants to know after that jump you made in France in 1945, did you and your unit get to the Pacific? No, no, that was in July that uh, that, that happened, that jump. And in uh, August, the atomic bomb hit, and that was the end of the war, and so they canceled the plans for sending us overseas to the Japanese war. And you and about 10 other, 10 million other GIs were overjoyed with the fact Ecstatic. that the war was over. Ecstatic. And Vince, I just have to ask one last question. You didn't really, you told the story of how the beer came about, but is, is the, because you're probably like me a little bit. You, you enjoy a good beer every now and then. How is airborne beer? Is it pretty good? Yeah, it's a lager, a dark beer, but uh, I'm not really a beer drinker. I'm a scotch drinker. But, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to have something to chase, uh, chase the beer but, with, but, I guess. But, uh, whenever I drink one, uh, and, uh, other people who are friends of mine who are connoisseurs with the beer, they say, yeah, it's a real good beer. Well, I'll have to try that again. Uh, again, the book is uh, Nuts, uh, a 101st Airborne Division machine gunner at Bastogne. It's available, as uh, Vince mentioned, in uh, Amazon and all the other usual places you can buy uh, books. And I, from the comments, Vince, I think we uh, sold a few of them tonight for you. So <laughs> okay. you're welcome. Uh, but Thank let's you. hear it again. Vince uh, Speranza, ladies and gentlemen, for our uh, in-house audience. Thank you. As always, Mark DePew, thank you for a, a wonderful job. And uh, Vince, again, thank you for the wonderful stories and uh, the wonderful opportunity to share them with our audience uh, worldwide on Facebook Live. I'm Joe Crane from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. We thank you for tuning in. A few people have also asked if this is available to watch afterwards. In a few minutes, Facebook will uh, uh, put this out and be available to watch as often as you want. What I will add there is that the first couple of minutes didn't uh, get into the, uh, the storytelling, but first couple of minutes there was a little audio glitch, but uh, uh, we will have another version that is uh, crisp and clean audio that will be available on our YouTube page for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum very shortly. And before you turn it over, yes. mention our webpage where you can find like 11 hours of Vince telling these stories. Yes, it is uh, oralhistory.illinois.gov, and I think we'll uh, bring that up on screen to let everybody see that as we finish up. Again, thank you to Vince for joining us tonight, and for all of you who have served in our military over the years, we thank you again for your service. Hope to see you again here live on Facebook from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois.